Hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to Triple N Media I am Dr Nick Nickum I have been a practicing cardiologist for more than 30 years at the Texas Medical Center I used to do interventional cardiology now I practice in Sugarland Heart Center in Sugarland Texas and welcome to our cardiology lecture series all our programs are video streamed through YouTube and please do subscribe to our YouTube channel if you have found our programs to be useful you can support our channel by donating whatever you can hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to triple n media i am dr nick nickum and today we are going to talk about uh, cardioversion defibrillation pacing in this presentation we are going to learn what is a defibrillator what is monophasic and biphasic defibrillation when do you do cardioversion when do you decide defibrillation is the best option when do you not do cardioversion or defibrillation what is the energy level that you need to use for a given particular rhythm problem which patient needs pacing so we're going to cover all these aspects and at the end of the presentation we are going to have a little quiz and hopefully by the end of this presentation you will have learned everything you need to know about defibrillation cardioversion pacing and the indications for each one of these so let us start off here is a rhythm as soon as you see this rhythm immediately you have to have a response your response must be should you defibrillate this patient should you do cardioversion should you call for a transcutaneous pacemaker don't worry before the end of this presentation you will learn a lot more about these entities let us proceed what is a defibrillator a defibrillator is a machine that delivers electrical energy electrical energy is nothing more than electrons traveling from one region to the other so the electrical energy is delivered from one paddle to the other paddle and in the process this electrical energy goes through the human heart which it defibrillates that means it depolarizes the entire human heart and let the spontaneous sinus rhythm take over that would be an idealistic situation but you get the message okay let's learn a little more about a defibrillator defibrillator obviously has a monitor it's got a bunch of buttons but most importantly behind the scenes it delivers energy this energy is expressed as joules one joule is the unit of work associated with one amp of current passing through one ohm of resistance for one second anyway that's too technical so let's not worry about it here are some important things we need to know a current current is the actual energy that is the electron delivered through defibrillation the ability of the current to reach a target organ and do its work there are two things that needs to be taken into consideration namely the impedance and the phase the impedance is the resistance if you are trying to get electricity through wood it's very hard but if you are trying to get electricity through a, a steel plate where the conduction is very fast it's going to just run through like a lightning our skin offers a fair amount of resistance that's why we use those gel pads to improve the the resistance to the flow of electric current the second part is the phase let's see what phase means when an electricity is applied from one paddle the discharge electricity goes from one paddle to the other and it is uh, known as monophasic this is known as monophasic defibrillator which we had for decades but more recently we have what is known as the biphasic uh, defibrillator where the electricity travels from one paddle to the other the paddles reverse their polarity as a result the electricity comes back and returns to the same paddle so twice the amount of energy is delivered during this process which makes it much more efficient as a result we need to reduce the number of joules needed to accomplish the same end goal so this is the difference between the monophasic 
and biphasic uh, defibrillators. It is very important because the amount of energy we, that we use with biphasic is almost half the amount of energy we would use with monophasic. Uh, so it makes a big difference. When do we defibrillate? The most common conditions during which we resort to defibrillation as opposed to cardioversion or pacing, the most common is of course ventricular fibrillation, ventricular flutter and unstable ventricular tachycardia. There may be people walking around with ventricular tachycardia, but uh, they all don't need defibrillation. But if you uh, have a ventricular tachycardia at a very rapid rate in an unstable patient, then defibrillation is the choice of treatment. If you are using a, a monophasic defibrillator, the standard is maximum power that you can get from the defibrillator, 360 joules. You just deliver the shock, wait for a second, look at the rhythm, resume the chest compressions and get ready for another shock if that is appropriate. However, if you have a biphasic defibrillator, the energy level that is needed is approximately from 120 to 200 joules for ventricular fibrillation, flutter or unstable ventricular tachycardia, including torso dip. So remember, the, this one is 120 joules. When do we do cardioversion? We can perform cardioversion when a patient is unstable but has palpable blood pressure, when the patient is short of breath, when the patient has a rapid ventricular response, the QRS could be narrow or it could be wide. But we have to have the patient is sort of conscious. When that is the situation, then it makes sense to attempt cardioversion because if the cardioversion works, that's good. If the cardioversion doesn't work and if the rhythm deteriorates, you can immediately charge and defibrillate the patient at the maximum uh, power. So let's look at some of the conditions here, like ventricular tachycardia, which is reasonably stable in, in the fact that the patient is alert, he's got little low blood pressure, maybe a little cyanotic, a little short of breath, but you have time to do a synchronized cardio version. Again, the amount of energy used is 200 to 360 joules if you're using monophasic, but I would just say get used to one system. If your hospital has biphasic defibrillator, just use biphasic for all circumstances so that you just need to remember only two or three different scenarios. Okay, if you have a biphasic system, you use from 120 to 200 joules. That is ventricular tachycardia or a patient with a supraventricular tachycardia with wide QRS complexes where you are not sure if that is uh, supraventricular or ventricular. Now let's look at the supraventricular tachyarrhythmias where the patient's condition is unstable. The blood pressure is slow, the patient is cyanotic, the patient is short of breath and you don't have time to wait for an intravenous drug to work. You resort to cardioversion. Uh, the conditions that would be most amenable to cardioversion in a narrow QRS tachycardia are paroxysmal atrial tachycardia with unstable patient, supraventricular tachycardia with unstable patient, atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. The interesting thing about atrial flutter is that it takes very little energy. It can take as less as, less as 25 joules, especially if you're using biphasic. Anyway, for all supraventricular tachycardias with narrow QRS complex in an unstable patient, your standard mantra should be 50 to 100 joules. Atrial fibrillation takes a little stronger energy. So for atrial fibrillation, I would just start off with 100 joules. If that doesn't work, you can gradually increase it, but you don't need to go to full energy because uh, it's not going to help. One condition where cardioversion may be unsuccessful is multifocal atrial tachycardia. 
So you may get this question uh, in your uh, written examination. Cardioversion for atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, PSVT, MAT. So you need to remember that. Okay, so this is in a nutshell the indications for defibrillation, indications for cardioversion, and the amount of energy we use for each given situation. Now we're going to go through a series of rhythm strips and it is your job to determine what the rhythm is and then immediately you have to make a snap decision as what is your treatment of choice. So what I'm going to do is let me read this slide to, so that you get oriented because all the remaining slides have similar questions. What is your diagnosis? What is your diagnosis and treatment option for this patient? All right. So here you have a rhythm strip and here are the options. Defibrillation biphasic 120 to 200 joules. Defibrillation biphasic 50 to 100 joules. Cardioversion 120 to 200. Cardioversion 50 to 100 transcutaneous pacing. So these are all the options related because we are talking about cardioversion, defibrillation and pacing. So what is the rhythm here? I'm going to suggest you pause this video for a second. And once you have established the diagnosis and the treatment option, you can resume so that uh, I can continue with the presentation and I can give you my best analysis of what the rhythm is and what I would choose to treat this particular patient. Okay, you're back. Let us uh, see. So this is uh, obviously like a ventricular fibrillation, what looks like a, like a tachycardia or fibrillation, which is like a torso D. So the best option for this in an unstable patient with no blood pressure, uh, the choice is defibrillation biphasic with maximum energy that you possibly can to see if you can re-establish the sinus rhythm. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, here is a 60-year-old patient who is in the hospital. He, uh, he has a blood pressure which is like 90 to 100. Patient is alert. Patient is talking to you. And here is a wide QRS uh, rhythm which is at a rate of, uh, I'll have to say, like almost uh, 140, something like that. So what is your treatment? Just pause here for a second. And when you come back, we'll continue with the presentation. Okay. Here we have a situation where the patient condition is a little unstable and a rhythm with a wide QRS complex. But the rate is not really that fast. The patient is alert. This is a situation where we may be dealing with ventricular tachycardia or possibly supraventricular tachycardia with uh, aberration, bundle branch block. But to me, this looks more like ventricular tachycardia. What I would do in this situation is attempt cardioversion for ventricular tachycardia. And again, I would be using higher energy level that is cardioversion biphasic 120 to 200 joules. That would be my option. Pacemaker is not an indication here and you don't need to defibrillate because you see clear, distinct R waves which the defibrillator can march and, and deliver a synchronized cardioversion. Okay, let's look at the next example here. What is your diagnosis and what is your treatment plan? I know some of you may be saying, well, there's nothing needs to be done here. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes if it's a young person, you would like to do something. So what can possibly be done that can change the outcome? This is almost like a systole. Just pause the video and come up with your diagnosis and treatment. Then we will continue. Okay. Basically, what looks like we have a, a systole. But this is a young person who was doing fine just half an hour ago. So you want to try everything possibly you can. So one of the things you can do is, of course, defibrillation or cardioversion is out of question because we don't have a discernible rhythm. So you may attempt a transcutaneous pacemaker, but I doubt 
the outcome is going to be very much uh, positive. Okay, this is an interesting tracing. What is your diagnosis and what is your treatment option? Pause the video here for a second. Write down your diagnosis, write down your treatment of choice, and then resume the video. Okay, you're back, and what we are dealing here is a wide QRS complex, but at the same time, we are seeing P waves. But the most interesting point is there's no relationship between the P and the QRS complexes. The PR intervals varying. So in other words, the atrial P waves are marching on their own. The ventricles are marching on their own at a much, much slower rate. And especially if this patient is unstable with a low blood pressure, hypoxia, basically we are dealing with a patient with a complete heart block. And the most appropriate treatment would be, of course, you can put this patient on transcutaneous pacing. Atropine could be tried, but in a complete heart block, uh, I'm not sure the atropine is going to be very effective because we have a AV block here and atropine reduces AV block. So I am not sure that we're going to get any profound improvement. We could use epinephrine or dopamine to support the blood pressure, but the most important thing is to improve the ventricular rate by using transcutaneous pacing. All right, let's move on to the next tracing here. Okay, here we have a fairly slow rate. Let me see. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. It's about like 45 heart rate. There are a lot of my cardiac patients who are walking around with a heart rate of 45 who are perfectly fine. But if this is a patient with a chest pain, who is in the emergency room with some EKGs, cha EKG changes suggesting ischemia, especially in the inferior wall, where they have inferior wall ischemia, which can lead to severe bradycardia, which could be symptomatic. If that is the condition, what would you do? Pause here for a second, then resume when you have your answer. Okay, you are back here. So if this was a tracing from a patient with an acute myocardial infarction. Of course, this patient would be going to the cardiac catheterization lab, especially in a patient with the inferior wall myocardial infarction who are more likely to develop a severe bradycardia. The ideal thing would be to introduce a transvenous pacemaker before you proceed with the cardiac catheterization and possible coronary intervention. If this is, if this were not a myocardial infarction patient, but if the patient was unstable, you can try to give atropine, 0.5 milligrams, up to a maximum of three milligrams to improve the heart rate. You can start them on epinephrine to support the heart rate and the blood pressure. If those things really are not successful, you could consider using transcutaneous pacemaker to increase the ventricular rate. Let's go to the next one. Okay. What is your diagnosis and what is your treatment option here? Pause the video because this is an important tracing which we need to spend some time. When you are ready, you can resume the video. Okay, you are back and what we are dealing here is uh, a supraventricular rhythm which is uh, irregularly irregular. Uh, it could be atrial fibrillation, but it looks like we see some distinct P waves, but the P wave morphology varies from beat to beat to beat. This is an example of a multifocal atrial tachycardia, which is most commonly seen in patients with a chronic lung disease. This is extremely difficult and not easily amenable to any type of treatment except improving the pulmonary oxygen and level and improving any underlying infection or bronchospasm. So I would focus on reducing the rate using drugs, maybe some digoxin or verapamil, since this patient may have chronic lung disease, and then try to improve the lung function, which may automatically bring the heart rate down. So this is not a candidate for defibrillation, cardioversion, or even transcutaneous pacing. Okay, what is your diagnosis and what is your treatment? Pause the video here, 
write down your diagnosis and treatment and when you come back we will resume with the presentation okay here we are dealing with a supraventricular tachycardia with distinct uh, p waves uh, and qrs complexes t wave this is a uh, sinus tachycardia at a rate of 125 the sinus tachycardia is an abnormal rhythm but we do not treat sinus tachycardia as such sinus tachycardia is usually due to infection myocardial infarction pulmonary embolus sepsis hypovolemia bleeding or any number of causes that can increase including temperature fever toxemia and we need to treat the underlying condition so you do not treat sinus tachycardia you treat the underlying condition which automatically convert changes the rate as the overall condition improves so this is not a candidate for defibrillation cardioversion or pacemaker let's move on to the next one here okay what is your diagnosis and what is your treatment plan just pause the video for a couple of seconds write down your diagnosis and uh, write down your treatment so this is a 65 year old man in the hospital lying comfortably no symptoms blood pressure 110 over 60 and he has had similar episodes in the past so what would you do okay here basically we have a patient with a ventricular tachycardia but if the patient had recurrent episodes of ventricular tachycardia and he is hemodynamically stable we can try to use drugs to convert this to sinus rhythm and maintain sinus rhythm of course the medical treatment of arrhythmias is covered in our acls drugs program which we would like you to please visit and watch that program uh, in this situation i mean if this is a sustained vt you could possibly you do cardioversion using 120 to 200 biphasic joules and if the patient is unstable obviously you're going to do defibrillation and try to establish the rhythm if there's no pulse you don't have time to play so go out with a higher dose and defibrillate the patient and see if you can establish the rhythm all right let's go to the next tracing here okay here is a tracing which has narrow qrs complex what is your diagnosis and what is the underlying condition by just looking at the EKG and what is your treatment option. Pause the video here and when you are ready you can resume. Okay, you are back. Basically we have a supraventricular tachycardia, narrow, narrow QRS complex. It is at a rate of almost 165. If you look at this RR interval, it is 165. When the rate is 165, it gives you a few differential diagnoses which you should always keep in mind. It could be number one, sinus tachycardia. It could be paroxysmal atrial tachycardia or usually after one six, sinus is up to 160 and 160 to 220 is uh, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia or this could be atrial flutter with two to one conduction if this patient was stable had a reasonable blood pressure oxygenating well then i would treat this patient with uh, i would treat this patient with adenosine six milligrams iv push if there's no response in two to three minutes give 12 milligrams of adenosine and see if you can break the rhythm since atrial tech, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia and atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction or a re-entry tachycardia, they are very easily amenable to both drugs and also electrical cardioversion. So if the drugs don't work, if the patient is unstable, let's the blood pressure drops to 80, then we can attempt a cardioversion for a narrow QRS tachycardia using a little lower dose, not like we use for ventricular tachycardia. 50 to 100 joules should be established, able to convert this into sinus rhythm. And they respond very well to drugs or cardioversion. 
So that's uh, so this is not a patient who needs pacemaker or anything like that. Okay, there may be a couple more examples. Let's see what do we have here. Okay, what is your diagnosis and what is your treatment option? You can pause the video here and when you're ready, just press the play button. All right, you're back here. What we are seeing is a, a normal sinus beat followed by an atrial premature beat. We have an atrial bigemini. Atrial bigemini by itself does not need any treatment. Atrial bigemini is an indication of something that is coming from the right or the left atrium and that chamber may be under stress, which means in due course, the patients can develop uh, atrial flutter or fibrillation if the, con if the overall condition gets worse. It just indicates you that something needs to be done. We can correct the electrolyte imbalances, we can correct the volume, we can correct the oxygenation and all this, but this in itself doesn't need any treatment. You can treat them with little beta blockers to hopefully prevent atrial flutter or fibrillation. And this doesn't need any one of these options because that they are not indicated in this particular patient. Okay, here we have a very, very slow heart rate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, it's almost like uh, if it's 10, it's 30. It's like 33, 34 heart rate. So you're looking at severe bradycardia. The patient is sweating. The blood pressure is 80. Oxygen is low. What do you do? Defibrillate? No. Cardioversion? No. One option is first try medications like atropine, epinephrine, dopamine. If they don't give the support, increase the heart rate as you want, you can use transcutaneous pacing where you would set the rate to like 80 and adjust the, the power so that the least amount of power can generate a good QRS complex associated with adequate hemodynamics. That's very important. You can have a rhythm, but if there's no blood pressure, it's worthless. It's doing nothing to the patient. Let's go to the next one. Okay, here is an example of an atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. And there are thousands of people walking around with atrial fibrillation with a heart rate of 140, 150, and most of them don't need any significant uh, treatment. However, if you are dealing with a patient with uh, acute myocardial ischemia or acute coronary syndrome who has a heart rate of 160, 170 with atrial fibrillation and he's having chest pain, hypoxia, then I think you need to look into the possibility of doing cardioversion using 50 to 100 joules, more like 100 joules for atrial fibrillation because in many cases, uh, this could have been in existence for a longer period of time as opposed to a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So that's the option I would choose. Let's look at maybe one more. Here's another example of a rapid ventricular response, which is 150 per minute. And here you have some clues. You have this sawtooth appearance of the atrial activity. So there is a tip off here. We are dealing with atrial flutter. Do you defibrillate this patient? No. Does the patient need transcutaneous pacemaker? No. The patient needs cardioversion. What is the energy? 50 to 100 joules. Sometimes you can even get by 25 joules, but if the patient is stable, you can try it. If the patient is unstable, I would just go to 50 or 100 joules and get the rhythm back to sinus if possible and try to address the hemodynamics, namely the blood pressure, oxygen level, etc. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last slide. Thank you very much for watching this presentation on ACLS cardioversion, defibrillation and pacing. Where do you use defibrillation? When do you use cardioversion? Who needs pacemaker? I hope uh, this has been educational to you. We will see you next time. Thank you so much. Again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I am Dr. Nick Nickham. I hope this program has been useful to you. 
please do subscribe to our YouTube channel where we can bring you a lot of uh, educational programs. If you would like to support this channel, uh, look for the dollar sign on the right hand side of your browser and donate whatever you can. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, I am Dr. Nick Nickham.